J'accuse. The sniper who shot Mohammed the child beneath his father's arm wasn't acting alone. Someone else in uniform, a junior cog in the wheel who was briefed at a higher level, positioned him there on the roof, a public servant, a cantor for the days of awe. And someone else manufactured the ammunition, and another had it distributed, like bars of chocolate. The tree doesn't go green when a single leaf unfurls. Many wrinkled brows leaned over the plans. History is known for heads like these. Technicians of slaughter, bastards in whose eyes morality is a pain in the ass. But now, there isn't any time for that. When right in front of the cameras, without any shame, grown men in uniforms are shooting into a helpless crowd. They gaze down into the veil of tears and toward the horde which is scrambling like jackals and rabbits. Grandchildren and great-grandchildren of refugees who were stripped of their homes and fields, wells and towns, and with an iron hand were driven into enclaves and ghettos. Each one of these authorities sees to his part in the plan. One's in charge of liquidation, another of the daily harassment. This one's field is public relations, that one collaboration. This one deals with expulsion and fencing, that one with the destruction of homes, because when it comes down to it, we're only speaking of a population of a certain size which needs to be pounded in ground, then shipped off as human powder. The outrage itself has to be packaged, like any piece of merchandise, with all the cliches of corporate politics. They'll give it a name, then a format can be arranged for stage negotiations with breakthroughs and concessions and moments of press-covered heightened tension, complete with a PR blitz full of talk. For this purpose, we have the spokesman, the journalist and author as well, the TV announcer and the professor, a long lineup of men of letters, all blowing into the process's trumpets. For the sniper who fired at the child is only a single stinking instrument with an enormous orchestra, which is conducted by the man who knows more than anyone else, that long-term solutions can be found for any and every problem when it's no longer breathing. The moment that man smiles, when hoarsely he pronounces the word peace, mothers wake up trembling, and now, at long last, he'll roll up his sleeves and get down to the work at which he excels and bring about a bloodbath. It is famously said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. It's not so famously said that it's not enough to remember the past. The enormity of what happened needs to be understood. 1894. In 1894, Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish French soldier, was charged with treason and imprisoned in the harshest solitary confinement. There was one problem. He was innocent, and the people who charged him knew it. The accusation was based on fraudulent handwriting analysis. Dreyfus was found guilty by a unanimous verdict and publicly disgraced at a ceremony of degradation, with the crowd screaming, death to Judas, death to the Jew. Imprisoned under life sentence at Devil's Island, he was shackled to his bed in the sweltering heat and guarded by men under orders not to talk to him. He could see nothing but the sky, was fed a diet of scraps and rancid pork that left him emaciated, his teeth rotted, and he all but lost the power of speech. Emile Zola, the famous French writer, was enraged at the government and the people. He wrote Jacques. Public letter to the President of the Republic by Emile Zola. The ultimate slap in the face to any notion of truth or justice. Leaks occur. Papers disappear as they are still disappearing today. 
This is the point of origin of the true crime, the shocking denial of justice which now sickens all of France. Now the nation is struck dumb. There are whisperings of terrible deeds and monstrous treasons. Crimes of historic proportions and naturally the nation goes along. The nation will applaud the public degradation. These unspeakable things, these dangerous things, capable of setting Europe aflame which have to be buried behind those closed doors. Are they true? No. Dreyfus is innocent. Ah. To think of all the madness and stupidity, all the mad fantasies, the low police tactics, the inquisitorial and tyrannical practices, the pleasure of some top brass tramping on the nation, stuffing its cry for truth and justice back down the throat on the lying, sacrilegious pretext of reasons of state. <clears throat> I defy the pe honest people to read the bill of indictment without their heart leaping in indignation and crying out in protest, hiding behind the odious anti-Semitism which will kill the great and liberal France of the rights of man, if not cured of it. It is a crime to exploit patriotism for works of hate. I accuse high officers in the military, government, church, the media of having suppressed the proofs of innocence, of an um, abominable campaign to lead public opinion astray, of the court in convicting a defendant based on the secret document, and of knowingly acquitting the actual guilty man. And what do I hear is only a revolutionary means of hastening the explosion of truth and justice. My fiery protest is only the cry of my soul. Let them dare to summon me to court and let the inquiry take place in broad daylight. I am waiting. With the publication of Jacques, Dreyfus became a symbol of reform. It was the ancien regime versus democracy, the Catholic Church versus multi-faith state, militant nationalism versus the rights of all people. Dreyfus became the symbol of oppressed people everywhere. The Dreyfusards fought, hoping that with his release would come the opening of the prisons for all the victims of social inequity. Much of their triumph was the way that men and women with prejudices, violent feelings, and deep-seated fears overcame, even if temporarily, these strong emotions to create the Dreyfusard's coalition. General Mercier, the Minister of War, concealed the military conspiracy to frame Dreyfus. He used Dreyfus as a show of his own strength after he was accused of being weak. He never backed down. Just like today, General Mercier was never charged. He was even elected to the Senate. For Dreyfus's wife, her life turned upside down. <clears throat> Lucy's letters sustained Dreyfus with an uncompromising and invigorating love, even though her shock at the verdict was immense. The new feminist paper reported her courage in trying to join her husband in captivity when she knew that the torrid heat and contaminated food might kill them both. She defied everyone who lied about her husband. She kept his case alive through petitions, letters, and legal interventions. I waited in anguish, in anxiety, and placed all my hopes in the few words that I was able to extract about my husband's health or on the reasons for his incarceration. Sometimes Colonel de Petit would tell me that my husband was ill. He spoke of the monster. That's the word he used. I protested with all my might against his accusation. What misfortune, torture, ignominy, everything will be sacrificed in the search for the culprit. The horrible infamy of which we are the object only tightens further the bonds of my affection. I would want to join you immediately. I would come to share exile with you and we would no longer suffer since we would be together. I shan't let you go there alone. I shall not be able to live without you. No, 
No, don't tell me that you don't want me to sacrifice myself. Please understand, my beloved treasure, for me it's not a sacrifice. My immense affection is my only guide. What I do, I do for my own happiness, and my decision is final. 2011. Dr. Hassan Dia. In France, there was the culture of anti-Semitism. Now, in North America and Europe, there is a culture of Islamophobia. Dr. Hassan Dia is Arab and Muslim. He is a Canadian university professor fighting for his freedom and for his life. He became a Canadian citizen in 1993. The French government wants him to face trial for what they allege is Dr. Diab's involvement in a 1980 bombing of a synagogue that killed four people. If convicted, he could spend the rest of his life in prison. There's only one problem. Dr. Diab's fingerprints don't match the suspects. His palm prints do not match. The physical description does not match. The handwriting does not match. The allegations against him have been found weak, <coughs> suspect, and confusing by a Canadian judge. With such a strong defense, one would think Dr. Diab would be breathing easy. Instead, he is strapped to a GPS monitoring bracelet, barred from leaving his home without a court-approved monitor, he cannot teach. His home is frequently invaded by RCMP agents, and he lives with the unimaginable stress that he might spend the rest of his life in a small French jail cell. Under Canadian extradition law, any country can press a case without describing the source or truthfulness of the information or whether torture was involved. This is the same thing that is allowed against many other people stigmatized by the Canadian government, such as refugees or Muslims facing secret hearing security certificates and Tamils fleeing genocide. Hassan Diab is a sacrificial lamb on the altar of good relations with the French government. France has been criticized by the international community and is currently before the European Court of Human Rights for violating the right to a fair trial, for running terrorist trials based on secret, anonymous intelligence. <coughs> for Dreyfus, there was General Mercier, who had to prove his own strength by scapegoating Dreyfus. For Hassan Diab, there is the French judge, Marc Trevedic, who needs to prove that he is not soft on Muslims. In Canada, there is Conservative Justice Minister Rob Nicholson, who will decide Hassan Diab's fate. Rob Nicholson is author of Harper's Omnibus Crime Bill. Hassan Diab, short poems. It is dark, it is night, I lay awake, waiting for the nightmare to end. It is light, it is day, the nightmare is still there, always there at all times. I eat, I read, I sleep, and the nightmare is my companion, it never leaves me. I beg, I plead, but, I, but it never goes away. Sometimes I see light glimpses of my old life. So much has changed, so much has been lost. I wonder how and why, I wonder when the truth will shine, I wonder when I will be free. The arrest. They came with guns and dogs. They came with armored cars, they were too many. They were everywhere. All of them, all of them came to arrest me. It was like a bad Hollywood script. Why do they always put on a show? It was a sunny and cold morning. I was about to drink my tea. It was my last cup of tea as a free man. No, no, I was not a free man. I have not been free for a long time in the land of freedom. I was not free. I was followed, harassed, and intimidated. All is justified, all is excused in the time, in the, in the name of national security. The trial. Kafka visited me. He asked how I was. I told him about my trial and he told me about his. We compared notes. <laughs> it pained us very much that history keeps on repeating itself. In the archaic law of extradition, I can't introduce evidence. 
I cannot deduce evidence that shows my innocence, but they can file handwriting reports one after another, even though it is not mine. They said I can change my writing. Strangely, that was what they said of Dreyfus a hundred years ago. Did we learn anything? Did anything change? The cage. I live in a cage. Some might say it's a big cage. But it is still a cage. It, was, it has been there for a long time. I forgot what it's like to be without. I can't leave home alone. I can't be outside on my own. I can't stay late. All of my moves are tracked. I am followed. I am harassed. I can't swim. I can't turn. I can't breathe. Rules everywhere. Rules every day. And all of these are not cheap. I have to pay dearly each one for the privilege to be in a cage. Otherwise, I am sent away to a dark, cruel, and bloody place, which we politely call a prison. Is all this worth being in a big cage? Scarred for life. I have to admit, it was hard and painful to write. Like a rusty knife in the heart, writing is beautiful, but in these times, it is agonizing. To expose your pain and lay it bare for all to see. It is easier when it is kept inside. You can pretend it is all a dream. What can I say? Who would listen? Who would listen to shouts of injustice? Do they travel far? Do they travel wide? There are, they are many out there, but who would listen? Please tell me that someone will. Please tell me that justice will prevail. Otherwise, it is a dark world. Apology. I apologize for the dark words. I was asked to write a poem, and I wanted to write something beautiful, cheerful, and hopeful. But under siege, the taste of life changes. I wish I can tell you otherwise. I really wish. I apologize. Muhammad Hakkar is one of the five Muslim security certificate prisoners arrested with secret evidence. Not even their lawyers are allowed to see the evidence. Mo and Sophie have to speak up. These cases really frustrate me. They show how governments will never willfully admit to their mistakes. The government ignores the psychological damage that this does to the people who are labeled suspicious. Just like Arar, I will have to live with these allegations for my whole life, and I cannot fight them in court. I was arrested on Human Rights Day, and I spent about a year in solitary confinement. For a while, I was treated as though I did not have any rights at all. I was in shackles, cuffs, feet, and waist, and I was not allowed to shave for 45 days. I was made to feel like an animal. It was three months before I had halal food and only after I refused to eat other food. They kept telling me, we are holding you until we can send you back to Algeria. We are going to deport you. And this was terrifying. It was like waiting to be walked to my own execution, which is what would happen if I was to be deported, with these allegations hanging over my head. The other guys, the other prisoners, they knew how long they were there. I was surprised at first at how much they sympathized with me. But looking back, it makes sense that other prisoners would understand what it is like to have someone throw you in jail and then throw away the key. They could understand that we are all human beings and that we all deserve justice. For myself, I was very nervous when I first went to see Mo. I remember my heart beating so fast that I was vibrating on my chair. I did not see Mo for the first few days and did not know if he was going to be deported in the meantime. I had never expected to visit someone I love in jail. Mo was in segregation the first year I visited him. He was in a small glass box at the end of the general population. He was wearing a bright orange suit, just like in Guantanamo. Now, he refuses to wear orange. The conditions were awful. Most of the phones would not work, and it felt like 100 degrees in there all the time. There was no fresh air to breathe. I could see Mo through a glass only twice a week for 20 minutes. I would often wait for four hours to see him in a waiting room that was really freezing in the winter and boiling hot in the summer. 
the sound of those big heavy metal doors closing behind each person who visited. It was the loudest vibrating noise ever. I heard those doors so many times, too many times. It was the le I will remember that sound always. I feared for Mo's life every day, especially when he was later removed to the maximum security section with the toughest criminals, those who made the news. They ended up protecting him, though. The other prisoners supported my husband and were good to him. I now have a profound respect for prisoners. Some end up waiting years for a trial or even a court date, or end up getting a sentence which turns out being shorter than the time they were held in remand. Often I would overhear discussions between prisoners and their families, and the sadness and inhumanity of their circumstances brought me to tears on numerous occasions. I was shocked to hear prisoners complaining about being hungry or about being cramped in a double bunk cell or sleeping on dirty floors infested with bugs. Mo was cut off from the outside world. He did not see the sky for the first six months, and he had no access to newspapers, TV, or radio, so he could not appreciate how important his case was becoming on the outside. I think all Canadians should be appalled that Canada has its own Guantanamo North in the Kingston area. It tends to shock many when they find out about it. One thing I have learned is that you cannot tinker with injustice. You cannot change one detail here, one detail there, and hope to fix a fundamentally flawed system. If it is unjust, you need to attack it head on and to abolish it. Zola's Jacques blames many people. Most of the people who are responsible for the injustice system never go to prison themselves and even feel entitled to do what they do. Dr. James Gilligan, former prison psychiatric director. Both moral value judgments and psychiatric diagnoses can serve as excuses with which to justify the unwillingness to listen and take seriously on its own terms what prisoners say, and to think what it means to that person, and to do the difficult and often emotionally painful work that genuine understanding requires. Visits to the maximum security prison are visits in hell. This is the world of Inferno, Golgotha, King Lear, of Auschwitz and Armenia, Andersonville and Attica, the Middle Passage and Wounded Knee. Entering this woeful city feels like entering the underworld, even though it is mostly above ground. I never cease to be amazed and appalled by the sheer number of men who are buried alive here. But I believe there is much more, that prisons resemble hell as much as they do, not just because of the character of the people who tend to occupy them, but also because throughout history, and with few exceptions, the societies that construct prisons have specifically wanted to make the prisons resemble hell as much as possible. My repeated experience in working in prisons is that it is politicians and the rest of us as voters who elect these politicians. We are responsible for keeping the resemblance between prisons and hell and between prisoners and the damned as close as possible. 1849. Henry David Thoreau, prisoner, celebrated author of Walden, American poet, naturalist, tax resistor, abolitionist, accuses people of being silent and ignorant. He feels they are useless in their lives. Thoreau. Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also a prison. Prisons, where the state places those who are not with her, but against her. The only house in a slave state in which a free man can abide with honor. When I came out of prison, I did not perceive that great changes had taken place on the common. And yet, a change had come to my eyes come over the scene. I saw yet more distinctly the state in which I lived. 
I saw to what extent the people among whom I lived could be trusted as good neighbors and friends. That their friendship was for summer weather only, that they did not greatly propose to do right, that in their sacrifices to humanity they subtly ran risk. That after all they were not so noble, but they hoped by a certain outward observance and a few prayers, and by walking in a particular straight though useless path from time to time to save their souls. I believe that many are not aware that they have such an institution as the jail in their village. 1964, Martin Luther King's letter from a jail in Birmingham, Alabama. I suppose I should have realized that few members of the oppressor race can understand the deep groans and passionate yearnings of the oppressed race, and still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. I have been so greatly disappointed with the white church and its leadership. Of course, there are some notable exceptions. But when, when I suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery a few years ago, I felt we would be supported by the white church. I felt that the white ministers, priests, rabbis of the South would be among our strongest allies. Instead, some have been outright opponents refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the, an the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. Who is their God? Where were their voices of support when bruised and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of complacency to the bright hills of creative protest? A prisoner who signs at his anonymous rights, Hell, oh, yes, I am still here. As I begin another year trapped in the horrorism of this day mare, it gets more and more difficult to tell what is real because there is nobody here to tell. In this stone and steel dungeon of solitude, only you could know the apartheid in which I exist 24 seven, alone in a space barely twice as wide as a coffin. Now, as I wither without beauty in the sunset of my life, like a broken vessel tossed dead and useless to the world, I have become as humbled as the stardust from which I came. In such a void of desolation beyond the lunatic fringe, there can be no warmth of voices here, not even a mirror to acknowledge I exist. So I drift in gothic darkness where no sunlight can touch my grave as the world spins further and further away. To you, adieu, forever I am, a Canadian prisoner in solitary. A victim of injustice by both the U.S. and Canada, a wrongfully accused First Nation prisoner writes, Silence, they say, is the voice of complicity. But silence is impossible. Silence screams. Silence is a message, just as doing nothing is an act. We are your own conscience calling to you. We are you yourself crying unheard within you. Let my unheard voice be heard. Let me speak my heart and the words be heard, whispering on the wind to millions, to all who care, to all with ears to hear and hearts to beat as one with mine. Put your ear to the earth and hear my heart beating there. Put your ear to the wind and hear me speaking there. There is so much trouble and injustice when people can't just stay human. The same First Nation prisoner writes, You must understand, I am ordinary, painfully ordinary. This isn't modesty. This is fact. Maybe you 
ordinary. If so, I honor your ordinariness, your humanness, your spirituality. I hope you will honor mine. The, that ordinariness is our bond. You and I. We are ordinary. We are human. The Creator made us this way. Imperfect, inadequate, ordinary. Imperfection is the source of, of, of every action. This is both our curse and our blessing as human beings. Our very imperfection makes a holy life possible. We're not supposed to be perfect. We're supposed to be useful. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you.